Good afternoon. Welcome to the launch of the World Happiness Report 2023 and happy International Day of Happiness. I'm your moderator, Sarah P. Jones. It's my honor and my pleasure to welcome everyone here today. I'm joined here by the editors of the World Happiness Report, John Hallowell, Richard Layard, Jan Emanuel Deneau, Laura Ackman, uh, Jeffrey Sachs, and editor Shun Wang is not here, but we do have the authors also of the chapters of the report. Our program today is as follows. I have a few opening remarks, and then we'll get to the exciting results. Each of the chapter authors will share their thoughts from their chapter, and all of you will have the opportunity to ask questions of the editors and the authors. Then we'll deliver you back to your day in about an hour's time after a panel discussion. Please take a moment to answer our three question survey about where you're joining us from and why. We would love to hear from you and the link is in the chat. Please also type your questions into the chat as we go along throughout the hour. I'll be putting those questions live to the editors and authors. Now, for the last 11 years, the World Happiness Report has given governments, the UN, policymakers, people on the street, facts and guidance about what drives happiness and well-being around the world. Each year, the world holds its breath for March, waiting for the world rankings to reveal who is the happiest country on earth. Each year, those at the top and those at the bottom are splashed across the cover of every major newspaper in the world. To become one of the countries at the top of the World Happiness Report rankings has gone from being a novel measurement 11 years ago to becoming one of the most coveted annual honors in government and economics. To strive for the happiness and well being of your citizens pays off for countries at the top of the list, quite literally. These countries enjoy a better economy, less corruption, and better life satisfaction for citizens. The report authors and editors have a mission they carry out every year with your happiness in mind to find out what drives happiness, to teach governments, organizations, and people like you and me what drives our collective happiness and to point out pursuits that are not driving our happiness as much as we think they are. But if there's one thing I know about while you have all zoomed in today, it is not to find out what makes you and your community unhappy. It's because you want answers to the question, what brings us happiness? Other than what is the meaning of life, this is the question most people feel is the most important question in the world, especially in the post-pandemic era. Many of us only ask ourselves this question when we think about making a big change like careers or relationships. But until I read the World Happiness Report, I never once asked myself that question before an election. Who will I vote for to affect my happiness? Who will I vote for to secure the happiness of my children and my children's children? And how can I and my community hold our governments accountable for that happiness? That's probably because my life experience is a naive reflection of the security the lack of corruption relative in my home countries, not living in a war, access to higher education, the freedoms of choice that that brings, the excellent support network I was lucky enough to be born into, marry into, and the friendships I take time to nurture. But many people in this world do not share my experience and in fact live in the world's upside down. And if their governments do not aspire for citizen happiness, they risk relegating their people to the upside down too. The World Happiness Report was originally intended for governments and policymakers, but after 11 years, it's not just governments who need to assess happiness using these measures. It's also you and me personally. Why? Because once you and I recognize the value of these societal contributors to our happiness and the happiness of those around us, you and I will fight for them. You and I will defend them. We will vote for those who defend them and hold them accountable. And we will take action in our communities to move the dial on these factors of happiness. So that's enough from me and my perspective on happiness. Let's hear from the real experts. It's my honor to introduce Professor the Lord Richard Layard, founder director of London School of Economic <coughs> Center for Economic Performance and co-director of the center's program on community well-being. Richard's co-written chapter one of the report, The Happiness Agenda, the next 10 years. Richard, please let's hear about the future. I hand the floor to you. Well, thank you very much, Sarah. So this is, of course, a, a joint chapter um, by the three founding editors of, of the World Happiness Report, um, Jeff Sachs, John Hanwell, and myself. Um, and we had a great time and, and took a lot of trouble writing this because, of course, it's about what the deepest beliefs that we all have uh, about the goal of our society. 
Uh, and the goal that we believe in uh, is uh, uh, that we want a society where people are as happy, fulfilled, and satisfied with their lives as possible. Uh, so that's what the rankings in the World Happiness uh, Report are illustrating. But then we only get a society like that if people take care of each other. So the kind of civic virtue that Aristotle talked about <clears throat> is crucial if we are to have a happy society. Uh, Aristotle used the term eudaimonia to describe what he called uh, the activity of the soul according to virtue. And at the country level, it's clear that um, if we have people like that, we will also have people who are feeling happy and fulfilled. So eudaimonia and happiness are going hand in hand uh, when we compare one country with another. If you think about individuals, it's not quite as simple as that, uh, is it? Because virtuous behavior uh, does, of course, very often give people a positive psychological glow. But there are also many unselfish people, for example, many carers, who are below the average of happiness. But of course, they're doing a lot of good. Um, and it's very important they do what they do. So we need to train all citizens in the skill of virtue, and that's a crucial means to achieving a happy society. <clears throat> now, there's another point. Uh, what is uh, really important is not just the average happiness uh, of the citizens. It's especially important that as few of them as possible are in misery. So one essential step to avoiding misery is, of course, to have a system of human rights uh, such as the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That is a basic means to the end of a, a happy society. Another really important point is, of course, uh, the interest of future generations, because the well-being and happiness approach says that everybody's happiness matters uh, wherever and whenever they're born. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, the happiness of future generations is as important as our own, uh, subject only to a very small discount factor. So a key element, again, in the happiness agenda is sustainability. And the 17 sustainable development goals are essential. In fact, they're best thought of as sustainable well-being goals. Uh, maybe after 2030, uh, when we have to have the next uh, uh, lot of goals, they could be officially designated Sustainable Wellbeing Goals or SWPs. So that's the goal. The goal is the happy society and especially the absence of misery. How do we get there? Well, obviously, that agenda implies a, a different set of priorities for every organization, one that reflects the evidence on what most affects well-being. So for governments, the rule must be to choose those policies which produce the most well-being per dollar of public cost. Uh, this means, for example, uh, more evidence-based treatment for mental health problems, including for children and adults with depression, anxiety disorders, and addiction. Uh, Britain has a program of improving access to psychological therapies that's being uh, copied in very many other countries, other areas where cost-effective policies need expanding, obviously, uh, well-being in schools, services for youth, uh, and support for the elderly. Let me move on to, to business, because the well-being agenda also calls for change in the priorities of business. Profit is, of course, a necessity, but the existence of a business is only justified by what it contributes to the well-being of society, meaning uh, not just the shareholders, but also workers, consumers, and suppliers. Similarly, schools should have the well-being of their children as an explicit measured goal alongside their academic performance. And they should use evidence-based methods to improve the life satisfaction of, of their children, which would also, of course, improve their academic performance. To us as researchers, the well-being agenda is also a challenge. We are going to need, in, in this next decade, to be able to provide policy makers 
with user-friendly models of the cost effectiveness of policies in terms of their impact on well-being. And of course, going back to what I said about Aristotle, uh, we need a high priority for research on how to help people uh, develop the habits of living virtuously. I'd, I'd like to end on a personal note, if I'm allowed to, <laughs> uh, by praising two organizations which aim to produce a happy society. One is Action for Happiness, which aims to help individuals to lead happier and more compassionate lives. Its members pledge to try and create as much happiness as they can in their lives and as little unhappiness. And the other is the newly launched World Wellbeing Movement, which aims to get decision makers to measure the well-being of those that their policies and decisions affect, and to make that well-being into the overarching objective of their organizations. So, so here are the main points that I've been making. Uh, the goal is a society with high levels of life satisfaction. The means is high levels of civic virtue, which includes eudaimonia and contributes to eudaimonia. The third is the uh, prevention of misery, where the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is so important. Future generations matter, why the SDGs are important, but hopefully would become SWGs. Uh, policy priorities have to change, and so do our research priorities. And it's a really important area of research, uh, well-being uh, for policy uh, <coughs> and decision purposes. Uh, and there are two good movements that are uh, pulling their weight uh, in the right direction. So thank you all so much for listening. I hope you enjoy the report, especially chapter one. Richard, thank you. Uh... Before we move on, I, I do have one question for you. Um, Nicomachean ethics is not something I ever thought I'd be talking about after leaving undergrad, but the three of you brought this up in chapter one. Eudaimonia requires moderation, uh, fortitude, a sense of justice, an ability to form and maintain friendships, citizens in the community. Um, these things appear to be some of the greatest challenges facing young people and marginalized people today. Can you clarify a bit more the relationship between life satisfaction and eudaimonia? Uh, sure, yes. I mean, life satisfaction is how you feel about your life. Uh, and uh, the goal is to have people who feel really good and fulfilled and satisfied in, in their lives. Then there's the issue, how do you get to that? Uh, and you're not going to get to, uh, a happy society if everybody is just pursuing their own happiness. Uh, they've got to be uh, pursuing the happiness of other people. Um, there is to, uh, an important extent to which that will also make them feel good, but they should be doing it uh, whether it has that effect or not. If we're to have a, a society uh, which is happy overall. So the, the pursuit of virtue um, is a central feature of eudaimonia, and it's a key element uh, in producing uh, a happy society. Uh, and I think that uh, we don't want the idea of a happy society to get confused with uh, people thinking they should be uh, happy all the time, just pursuing their own happiness. Uh, we want it to be an inspiring vision, which involves you um, in trying to make other people happy, whatever contribution you can make, uh, and of course, as an empirical matter, uh, finding that your life is more meaningful if you do that. I think that particularly for young people, who many of whom seem to be uh, quite uncertain what should be the purpose of our lives, I think this is a really inspiring ideal, and so it is to all of us. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for that. Um, I would love to call to the to the dais here, uh, University Professor Jeffrey Sachs now, Director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University, founding co-editor of the World Happiness Report, president of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, uh, and podcaster for Thinker, Doers, Dreamers. Um, Jeff, can I hand it over to you for some yeah, remarks? Absolutely, Sarah. Thank you, and uh, a happy day of happiness to 
everybody. Uh, it's great to be with you. Sorry to be joining. Uh, just a few minutes late, I'm at a UN meeting uh, in Vienna. Uh, so I uh, just got off a panel and I'm happy to be with you uh, just now and uh, delighted and always honored to follow uh, Richard Laird, who has been a great pioneer in this area together with John Helliwell. Uh, and uh, I'm, I've, been, I've been thrilled to be working together with them and uh, Yana Manuel uh, Denev uh, and Laura Aknin and other colleagues during the past 10 years on this agenda. Uh, we need this more than ever. Uh, the world is not in a, uh, in, in a happy state. Um, in fact, it's in an extraordinarily dangerous and challenged state. And I'll just uh, uh, say a few words more about what Richard was uh, saying about virtue, uh, because virtue ethics and happiness uh, in our ancient traditions, uh, our sage traditions, uh, whether of Plato and Aristotle or Christianity or Buddhism or Hinduism uh, and uh, other great ancient wisdom traditions went hand in hand that to be happy was uh, a skill that one developed by being a good person and uh, aristotle explained that being a good person meant being good to oneself uh, in the sense of taming one's uh, bad uh, uh, bad uh, instincts and uh, using reason and uh, taking care and being temperate and moderate and so forth, but also being good to others. Because as Aristotle said, uh, we are zoon politikon, we are political or social animals. We only find our happiness in society. Uh, and so he argued for two kinds of sociality. In the Nicomachean Ethics, he wrote a whole chapter about friendship uh, as vital to happiness. And in the companion volume, The Politics, he wrote about civic virtues, living in a polis, in a community, political community, uh, as a decent people. We forgot a lot of that in modern history. Uh, the ancient uh, traditions were brushed aside by some very bad philosophy uh, of uh, Hobbes uh, and uh, others uh, who uh, said people are evil, uh, they're nasty, they're uh, ruthlessly ambitious, insatiable in demands. Uh, and uh, it's all a game of uh, power or wealth. Uh, and so modern philosophy turned away from the issue of personal and social virtues and turned to how to tame uh, the uh, bad instincts of human beings who were pretty incorrigible in Hobbes model. Hobbes said you need a leviathan, an all powerful government. Uh, Machiavelli just accepted that politics isn't about the common good politics is about the prince keeping power uh, and uh, later writers uh, in this tradition just talked about preference maximization but it was all about maximization it wasn't about moderation it wasn't about friendship it wasn't about the skills of being a good citizen in a political community well i i think we need to go back to uh, the ancient wisdom fortunately when you do that around the world, whether it's a Confucian thought or Buddhist thought or Hindu thought or Christian thought or Jewish thought or uh, uh, ancient Greek philosophy, you find deep similarities, which is a good society uh, needs good people. Uh, it's one of the roles of the society to help nurture good people who know how to behave, uh, take care of each other, have generosity, have moderation, uh, understand what the common good is about. And I think that uh, the research over the last 10 years of the World Happiness Report really emphasized this point. And this year's excellent chapters, and I just wanna thank all the people who wrote the excellent chapters. For example, the chapter on state effectiveness, which is a terrific paper. Uh, the chapter on altruism and happiness are emphasizing different aspects that we, we don't achieve our happiness alone. We don't achieve our happiness by maximizing our 
utility function uh, by the most goods we can buy or the most wealth we can accumulate. We achieve our happiness within societies. We need governments that function for the common good. Like Aristotle said in, in the politics, not like Machiavelli said, like Aristotle said. We need that. And we need our own proper way of behaving towards others. That's what the chapter on altruism emphasizes. People who are altruistic are happier people. But it makes sense. It's people who have an other regarding this, who live for others and with others well. And I would like to see this instilled in the coming years. I also would like training of our national leaders in virtue and happiness before they blow us all up because uh, they know a lot about war but they don't know much about talking with each other they don't know much about sitting down with each other they don't know much about negotiating with each other here we have a war raging in which the u.s and russia are facing off and biden hasn't picked up the phone once to talk to president putin well I would like us to train our political leaders in virtue also. Thanks a lot. It's a, an incredible uh, honor to be part of this venture. As Richard said, we need to put happiness at the center of our politics, at the center of our personal lives, at the center of our attention in schools and how we help children to become fulfilled uh, members of society and to build the skills for happiness in our workplaces as Yana Manuel Denev has been writing so beautifully in, in many reports and this is what we're aiming to uh, do in the in the second decade of the world happiness report so thank you very much and a really a, a happy day for everybody thank you for joining mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Jeff. Thank you for those remarks. And I think we all uh, agree that we hope that the leaders of our world will listen to those kinds of messages, listen to each other, and that virtue becomes at the forefront of our leaders' minds. Now we're going to turn to John Hallowell, co-editor of the World Happiness Report, to reveal what's behind the rankings this year and to tell us about how benevolence is affecting our happiness. John. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, you can see, uh, those of you who are dialing in from all over the world, uh, how much fun uh, Jeff and Rich and I had doing chapter one, which they both have been telling you about. I'm going to take you down into some of the data. Uh, I'm going to start, first of all, by showing you the rankings that bring so many people to the report. Uh, of course, for us, the rankings are just something that bring people in. We want to then focus back on some of the issues about what really does underlie a happier society. Now, uh, this year, you'll notice I've shown here on the first slide the top 25 countries um, that we also have added not just the uh, rank on the left, but the range within which the rank for each country falls, which is shown on the right of that picture, and it'll be in the version you pick up online as well. Uh, that's the top of the rankings there. The next slide, Sharon, is the bottom of the rankings. And you can see what a huge gap there is. There are only three countries that are not sharing a rank range with anybody else, and it's Finland at the top and Lebanon and Afghanistan at the bottom, all of which have their own uh, values uh, distinct from any other countries. In the middle, countries can be within a range of 20 or 30 with a probability range. One of the things we've done this year is dig deeper into the inequality of well-being and asking ourselves, how to, what are smart ways to measure the inequality of well-being? And the one we came up with and we can look at the next slide now, is what is the happiness gap between the average in the happiest half of the population and the unhappiest half? In general, of course, uh, we have found lots of evidence, and Richard and Jeff already alluded to this, that people are happier when they're living in countries that are more equal. 
Now, the happiness gap then you'd think would be smaller in the happier countries. There are some very unhappy countries that have a small happiness gap. And there you see Afghanistan at the top. That's because everybody's unhappy. So there's not a big gap between them. <clears throat> you could have the same thing at the top as well. But in general, people are happier living in countries where the inequality of happiness is less. Uh, <clears throat> and so, that is, in some sense, the empirical backstop to uh, what uh, Richard and Jeff have already been saying, that uh, you have to focus on the happiness of others. But it turns out that countries that do, people that do, societies that do, are themselves happier for that emphasis on looking after each other. Next slide, please. Now we're looking at what's happening over the last 15 plus years for the top half and the bottom half. And so the solid top line is the, 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 the green line is the mean. It looks pretty constant there over that period. The top and bottom halves look to your eyes as though they've been getting further apart. They have indeed, if you compare the first half of the period to the second half of the period, the average gap has risen by almost half a point, so that there's more inequality of well-being than there was before. Focusing on the three COVID years to the three years preceding, um, which is one of the other focuses of this year's report, there has been no widening of that gap uh, within that period. The overall level of misery uh, has been roughly uh, constant during this period, but that's a good sign, of course. Well, you'd like to see it coming down. Next slide, please. Thank you, Sharon. So uh, one of the striking things that's been true for several years uh, is the convergence between Western and Eastern Europe. And so here we've got the top and bottom halves in Western Europe and in Central and Eastern Europe. You see the happiness gap is less in Western Europe than in Eastern Europe. But the striking thing is that the average levels of well-being have been rising and inequality dropping in Central and Eastern Europe relative to uh, Western Europe. And that convergence has been going on a long time. It essentially, there are no changes in that. Uh, if you want to look at the COVID years, which you can do on this picture, uh, you'll see a low for the world as a whole. Average uh, life evaluations in the three COVID years are essentially exactly the same as they were in the three previous years. But in Western Europe, there has been a decline that you see as the, uh, especially for those in the bottom half of the distribution, you'll see for those at the top, it's really no difference. But from the, in the bottom uh, is where it's been felt as much of what we read and hear would tell us. Next, please. Uh, another feature is and thinking about the uh, convergence from east to west, the three countries that have converged fastest in uh, Eastern Europe or Lithuania, the three Baltics, uh, Estonia and Latvia, where they've all come up dramatically. And you can see it's shown even more dramatically if you look at the shares in misery, the proportion of the population answering three and below is the pink. And then the gray, gray pink is, uh, is those answering four. So you can use two different measures of misery, but you can see by all measures, these countries are happier than they were uh, 15 years ago. And uh, they're the most dramatic convergers. They've come up an average of about 25 places in the rankings each over the last uh, seven or eight years. Next. So uh, the next thing we're going to look at is the uh, some of the emotions. Here we have enjoyment and worry. And you can see each half of the population. So uh, there's been a, a bit of a spread between the half. You know, there's more of top bottom spread in both worry and enjoyment. Uh, so <clears throat> there's some inequality there. Um, but a notable thing here, we, we can put enjoyment and worry on the same graph for top and bottom and they don't overlap. A general feature of these emotional results we have is that the positive emotions on average are twice as prevalent as negative ones. Next. And this is social support and helping a stranger. 
the social support is the key. Do you have someone to count on in times of trouble? Perhaps our central variable in our whole modeling of well-being. It's of critical importance. You can see there has been a, a growing gap. The, there has been no decline in the social support for the top half of the population, although there has been some at the bottom. So there's been a growth in the uh, gap between the two. Uh, helping a stranger is one of the striking things about last year's report, and it happened again this year, uh, is a huge rise in the extent to which people uh, reached out to help a stranger. Notably on this picture, you can see it was true for the happiest half of the population and the unhappiest half equally have come from where they were to something that now is a level 25% higher than pre-pandemic. Next. Uh, I'm going to, I'm running out of time, so I'm, because we, we've only got an hour and we, we want to make sure you hear the next three chapters. Uh, so uh, you, these are different groups of countries that we divided, and then uh, we found that in the first years of uh, COVID, the countries that had an eliminator strategy, had much lower death rates. It's the Western Pacific region of WHO and the Nordics other than Sweden. Uh, and next slide, please. And we show even when you put all three years together, because now essentially under Omicron, uh, all strategies are off the table uh, and uh, death rates are converging around the world. But it still remains true over those three years that the eliminators uh, no longer have a current advantage, but they had an advantage in the past that leaves them uh, definitely better off. Next, please. And this is going back to the uh, benevolence. Uh, you looked at health stranger, and uh, these are the different measures. Last year, they were strikingly up. You can see in 2022, they're still way above what they were pre-pandemic. Next, please. Uh, and now this is going to Russia and Ukraine, another example uh, case we've looked at. You'll see average life evaluations in the two countries starting in 2012. Uh, after uh, the annexation of Crimea uh, and the gap rose mainly by drops in Ukraine to a gap of two, uh, which is in life evaluation terms is huge. It's uh, equal to the multiple of levels of income per capita. They converge gradually until 2021, and then you can see what happened in 2022. On the right-hand panel B, you can see what happens to uh, the approval of national leadership. So we've got three measures here. We've got respondents in Russia and their approval. You can see both in 2014 and in 2022, Russians generally approved of their leader more under what was being done. Uh, the same is true not in the post-2014 period, but definitely in 2022 in Ukraine, so that the uh, trust in own government has risen in Ukraine uh, by much more than in Russia, putting them at the same levels in 2022. The dotted line shows you the uh, trust among Ukrainians uh, in the Russian government. And you can see that fell dramatically in 2014 and, and remained at about 10% uh, averaging across the country until 2022 when it essentially disappeared everywhere in the country. Of a thousand people surveyed, there were only two who had any approval uh, of, of Russia's policy. Next. And worry, of course, each time, and this is especially in Ukraine and not in Russia, rose in 2014 and then sharply again in 2022. Acts of benevolence, and here we're getting back to something we'll hear more about from chapter four. Um, those acts of benevolence were up all over the world during the pandemic years, including both uh, Ukraine uh, and Russia, the dotted lines are the helping stranger lines, which took the biggest uh, increases. You'll notice in Ukraine, both measures are up in 2022, and in Russia, both measures are down in 2022. So although both took part in the previous posts, uh, the, the reactions are different during 2022. Next, please. Uh, 
here we have uh, something new this year where we were looking at benevolence, uh, sorry, social connections. Uh, there's a, a meta Gallup survey looking in, in detail for seven countries. What are the average levels of feelings of social support, feelings of social connection, and of loneliness? People talk about the pandemic of loneliness. But in fact, during 2022, which is when this survey was taking place, in each of these seven countries spanning six global regions, uh, the prevalence of social support and social connection was double that of loneliness. And the next picture will show you that not only was the prevalence much greater, um, but so was the effects. So if you, you these positive things, they're not only more prevalent than the negatives, uh, they were more important and the negatives in determining your satisfaction. Well, the purpose of these four components of happiness and our examples of the evolution of happiness I've taken you through now is to help explain uh, the key factors that have made it possible for life evaluations to remain on average across the world as stable as they have during three years of crisis. Thank you very much. And I turn over now to the chapters from our invited guests who have been wonderful at providing an opportunity to dig deeper. John, thank you so much. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce the co-author of the Wellbeing and State Effectiveness chapter, Joseph Marshall from the London School of Economics who co-authored this chapter for Sir Timothy Besley and Torsten Pearson. We turn now from the benevolence of individuals to how effectively our countries are operating and how that affects our happiness and well-being. Joe. Great. Thank you very much, Sarah. I will try and follow on from those giants of happiness research. Um, yes, my name is Joe Marshall, and I'm one of the authors on Chapter 3. Uh, one of my co-authors, Tim Besley, is also here in the call. But unfortunately, our third co-author, Torsten Pearson, could not make it today. Um, so as we've seen today, and the World Happiness Report has been arguing this for a long time, uh, raising the well-being of citizens should be a primary goal of governments worldwide. But how exactly can governments pursue happiness as a policy goal? So our chapter attempts to flesh out this theory by first introducing the components of an effective state, as per the Besley Person framework popularized in their book, Pillars of Prosperity. And then we attempt to link these components with happiness empirically. We find that core state capacities, that is the ability to raise taxes, to deliver services, and to maintain the rule of law, and the absence of repression and civil war are all strongly positively correlated with measures of well being at the country level. However, the Besley Person framework stresses that there is no magic bullet when it comes to building an effective state, but rather, income, state capacities, and peace form a complex web of mutually dependent links. And therefore, it is useful to think in terms of, of clusters, in terms of groups of countries that share similar levels of capacities and peace which we find arise naturally in the data. So the ultimate goal of a state is to become a common interest state, which we define fully in the chapter, but essentially they can be characterized by having strong state capacities and a history of peace. And then crucially, we find that being in such states is associated with a two point increase in one's cantral ladder score of life satisfaction. So given the numbers we just saw from that presentation, that's pretty substantive. Then we find that effective states are not just instrumental to the level of happiness, but also to the spread of happiness. So in these common interest states, not only are they the most happy, but, and again, this rhymes with what John has just been talking about, happiness is much more equally distributed across citizens. Finally, and this should bring some comfort to those uh, in the chapter two team, their determinants of well-being that we've just discussed, so GDP per capita, social support, healthy life expectancy, and freedom to make life choices, freedom from corruption and generosity, are all strongly correlated with our measures of state effectiveness as well. So we had some discussions with John, and we believe that the state effectiveness measures are upstream in the causal link to 
the chapter two determinants. So to, to give a concrete example of that, strong collective capacity enables, say, vaccine provision and therefore healthy life expectancy, which in turn drives happiness. Anyway, I don't want to spoil the, the contents of, of the chapter too much. Uh, we had a lot of fun writing it. We hope you enjoy reading it and, and thank you for listening. Great. Terrific. Joe, thank you. Thank you very much. Up next are Sean Rose and Abigail Marsh, whose chapter Doing Good and Feeling Good will address altruism and well-being. Sean and Abigail on chapter four. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Sean Rhodes. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And today I'm very happy to present the highlights of chapter four for this year's World Happiness Report on the relationships between altruism and well being for altruists, beneficiaries, and observers. This work was a collaborative effort between uh, me and my PhD advisor, Abigail Marsh, who is a professor at Georgetown University. The last three years brought seismic changes uh, to our social and emotional lives, as well as mental and physical health, as the COVID-19 pandemic catalyzed various forms of social, political, and economic unrest all over the world. But unanticipated positive changes were also documented during this period. There was a surge in various forms of altruism. During this time, more people donated to charity, volunteered, or helped a stranger than in the years leading up to the pandemic. Countless people in need of assistance undoubtedly benefited from this increase in altruism with likely impacts on global subjective well-being. Here we're defining altruism as any costly behavior that improves the welfare of another person and does not bring any tangible benefit. While subjective well-being is measured through assessments of life satisfaction and positive or negative daily emotions. In our chapter, we review how altruism is linked to subjective well-being for beneficiaries, altruists, as well as observers. Today, I'll briefly review a few examples that demonstrate the complex bi-directional nature of these relationships around the globe, but please check out the chapter for more. Starting off, evidence suggests that altruistic acts typically do improve beneficiaries' well-being, which is in line with the goal of altruism. This can include increasing objective indices of their well-being, such as relieving a financial hardship via monetary donation or improving their physical health, for example, via blood donation. But it can also include and often does result in greater subjective well-being of beneficiaries. People on the receiving end of altruistic acts often report greater levels of happiness, life satisfaction, and lower levels of negative emotion. However, it should be noted that it is possible for altruism to lead to unintended negative effects. For example, beneficiaries may experience negative emotions when they feel in debt, dependent, or think the altruist is acting for their own gain. The relationship also appears to run in the opposite direction. Typically, altruism is the result of empathic concern elicited by, someone, by seeing someone in pain or distress. But people who display more positive emotions are also more likely to receive help. People may prefer helping those who appear happier because they're seen as more desirable social partners. And those who benefit from altruism are also likely to pay the altruism forward in the future, possibly due to feelings of gratitude, but also guilt. While it's clear that altruism improves the well-being of beneficiaries, it may be less obvious it would improve the subjective well-being of altruists themselves since altruistic acts often entail a cost to the actor, but it often does. All over the globe, it's clear that people's happiness increases after helping strangers, spending money on others, or volunteering. And this is an effect that's particularly robust when altruistic acts are a personal choice, but reduced when helping is viewed as obligatory. Uh, well-being increases not only the likelihood of being the beneficiary of altruism, but it also increases the likelihood of engaging in altruism. Uh, much work has demonstrated that people who are happier help strangers, give to charity, are more likely to donate blood, bone, air, bone marrow, and organs, invest more hours in volunteering, spend more money on others, and exert greater effort to benefit others. Two recent global investigations have found this at the geographic and individual level. One of these studies found that country-level life satisfaction was associated with seven forms of altruism, including charitable donation, blood donation, kidney donation, volunteering, helping strangers, bone marrow registration, and animal welfare policies. In some cases, acute stress is also linked to altruism. This was well demonstrated during the pandemic. During this period, people experiencing the most stress were the most likely to exhibit increases in altruism. 
This may because uh, this may be because fear or stress uh, motivates people to act, which can manifest as helping behavior when the stress emerges in the social context. It may help to explain the surge in altruism observed during the COVID-19 pandemic. And finally, we briefly note that even just observing altruism can be beneficial. Observing altruism increases mood, energy, desire for affiliation, the motivation to do good things for others, and the desire to become a better person among other things. Uh, but it should be noted that in some cases, observing altruism may also lead to negative emotions. For example, when witnessing others deviating from norms where it's less acceptable to act altruistically, or if the act makes observers feel worse by comparison. But when third parties do feel the benefits of observing altruism, it may motivate them to act altruistically as well. Observing altruism may lead people to update their beliefs about normative behaviors and as a result, adopt more altruistic norms and behaviors in the future. Taken together, the available evidence suggests that the global increase in altruism during the pandemic is great news on multiple accounts. Not only is an increase in altruism good in its own right, but this wide, widespread or increase certainly, almost certainly contributed to increases in remarkable resilience and global well-being during the same time period. This leaves me optimistic and I look forward to the future work that will continue to unpack these bi-directional relationships, which will be crucial for identifying the most effective ways to promote altruism and well-being around the world. That's all I have for now. Thanks so much for your time and attention. We're delighted to have been able to contribute to this year's report and I hope you enjoy reading the chapter. Sean, thank you for that. Now let's turn to our final presenter, Johanna Seikstead, Assistant Professor in the Department of Psychology and the Institute for Human-Centered AI at Stanford University. Johannes is going to tell us about the state of the art of measuring well-being through social media. Johannes. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to see you this morning from all across the world. It's so nice to be here. So um, what we've seen so far is in large part based on surveys. And to collect surveys from all around the world is a very heroic effort, um, but it has certain limitations. Um, and these limitations can in part be alleviated by relying on social media data, on big data sets that people naturally produce in the digital ecosystems they already inhabit, um, places like Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, online spaces. These spaces capture the language they leave in these digital spaces, um, leave cues, how people are thinking, feeling, and how they're behaving. And so we can use this data to measure well-being for millions of people. We can get to parts of the world and to small areas of the world where um, services are not available. We can do this fairly cost effectively. We can do this below the annual level and we can do this below the national level. And we can extend this measurement in principle to many constructs. So not just life satisfaction and happiness, but we can also think about new constructs that might be perhaps more appropriate for other parts of the world, like harmony and balance and justice, things that may um, be valued in different parts of the world. All of this, we have a sort of flexible infrastructure. And of course, we can go back in time, right? So if there's a crisis happening in the world or an unforeseen epidemic, we can go um, to the before days and get, get pre-event data to then compare to, to post-crisis data. So um, be, in part because of the potential of these digital data spaces, um, social media measurement is happening around the world. For example, the Mexican government, INEGI, or the, the Institute for Statistics with the Mexican government, um, has rolled out an online tool to measure affect of Mexican prov provinces. This is online right now. Um, we have shown that this can be done, for example, for Spanish provinces. Of course, we've done this in the US. Um, and this can be done here by another research group. This can be done all the way down to the census tract level for cities. So these are all based on Twitter. Um, and they so these are pipelines that collect Twitter data and then they analyze it with machine learning and then they generate estimates of, if nothing else, happiness. Uh, normally it tends to be a measure of sentiment or a, a measure of affect. Um, but we, as I said, we have a broader toolkit. But this work has advanced. It has advanced to three generations, which is what we argue in our, in our chapter. Um, in generation one, um, which I call the how hard can this be approach, um, you take random Twitter feeds and you aggregate this and you run, say, sentiment against it. In generation two, you get more sophisticated. You um, think of Twitter as really a, a set of people that you describe. 
um, and you understand. And then generation three, you follow people over time to understand longitudinal trends. And I'm just gonna showcase this a little bit so you get a sense. So generation one looks like this. You take the raw tweets, say, you aggregate them to counties, say in the US, and then you're done. Um, and then in generation two, a bit of a breakthrough, um, you take the tweets, you aggregate them within users, and rather than have billions of tweets, you now have 5 million users, so 1.5% of the US population in this case, um, that you have the tweets nested within, and you can that already controls for bots. Um, then you can estimate the age, gender, income, and education of these users, so you can post-stratify your sample, you can deal with representation biases, and then you get a stabilized language sample. And when you use these pipelines to estimate the life satisfaction of communities by comparing what Gallup says to the language you see on Twitter. In this case, we use um, topics, which are particular kind of language frequencies. And we build a machine learning model just going from Twitter to life satisfaction and say, if we try to predict life satisfaction from Twitter, how well does it compare against what Gallup says? And we benchmark this against, say, the logarithm of income, you see that the if income predicts life satisfaction this well, this is the first generation of methods that predicts life satisfaction from Twitter. And this is the second generation. We're now moving on to the third generation. And to give you an example of how good this can look, this is what a map looks like that's only based from Twitter that predicts this for the US down to the county months level. So um, looks at changes even um, month to month for counties. And to give you a, a final example here for the third generation of methods that follows people over time, we do everything we did before, except now we look at how people change in regards to themselves, which really stabilizes the variance in these models and the, the, the trends in these models. Um, these models in the past could have been very noisy. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen a social media sort of sentiment graph, but they can be very noisy. And so to give you one example of what this looks like right now, this is sadness in 2020 reported by Gallup. If you're wondering what this peak here is, this is the murder of George Floyd, one of the most negative affective events ever measured um, in Gallup data or ever measured on social media. And then compare this week to week plot here against what we measure with this new Twitter pipeline. And you see how stable these measurement architectures have become. And so if we look beyond these three generations that I've outlined here, of course, there's been other methods of progress in the population measurement of well-being. Um, so rather than how the data is aggregated, there is more sophistication as you go through how you take language and turn it into well-being estimates from dictionaries to machine learning to all the large language models and the deep learning and GPT, these, these artificial intelligence systems. But it actually turns out that the way you aggregate the data and the way you cluster and understand data within people um, is more important. So um, I hope to have um, whet your appetite a little bit to read more about these methods in our chapter. Thank you very much for your attention. Johannes, thank you for that. I have a number of questions uh, that have come from the, the Q&A from our audience. And I might ask if all of our editors and our authors uh, can come to the forefront here. And I have a question, uh, perhaps that I could uh, direct to John from Gabrielle. How does the trust, how does the level of trust social and institutional influence the level of happiness? John, hello, please. Um, the short answer is deeply and everywhere. Uh, one of the examples we in, enjoy talking about a lot is because it's instructive is that uh, if you combine trust and benevolence, as you do, if you see a wallet on the street and you pick it up and go and find the person who owns it, people are very much happier living in an environment where that is true. Uh, and thank goodness there have been experiments showing, on average, people who live in high trust environments think their wallets will be returned. Uh, indeed, are places where wallets will be returned so that people are very good about telling whether they're in a relatively high trust place. What they're very bad at 
is realizing how trustworthy the world is relative to what they read and hear about. So on average, the number of wallets that will be returned is double or more the number people think will be returned. So A, trust is enormously important, and B, its effect is under recognized and its presence is under recognized. So that has to be an important part of the story we tell. Well, I will remember that next time I leave my wallet or my laptop in the back of the bus. So thank you. I'll be much more of an optimist. I appreciate that, John. Um, this is a question that perhaps could be uh, for Richard. Uh, this is from Grace. What are the potential and limitations of using well-being data for development policy? Is there room for theorizing happy development? Well, I think it is uh, just as relevant to development um, uh, and poorer countries as it is, as it is to, to richer countries. Uh, and, and interestingly, uh, there are many common features. Uh, for example, um, if you're looking at the effect of a proportional change in income, uh, on well-being in a poor country, uh, it's exactly the same as it is in a rich country. Of course, the, 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 a, a proportional change of 10% in a poor country um, is a much smaller amount of money than a proportional change in a rich country. But there are those sort of basic similarities which seem to be built into uh, human nature and equally, of course, the, the importance of uh, human relationships uh, <clears throat> and the social context um, is just the same in rich countries and poor countries. And perhaps I can just take, a, take the opportunity here of taking a swipe at the Maslow theory of hierarchy of emotions, uh, which implies that until you've got a decent income, social connections are not so important. It, it's not like that at all. In fact, the, the founder, really, of happiness studies, uh, Ed Diener, uh, did a wonderful paper in which he looked at all the different uh, Maslow items and showed that they each have a, an independent effect on happiness. So I think that the, the fundamental thing is that human needs are very similar uh, across the whole world. Um, and uh, we therefore need to take into account all the, all the factors, um, both the health factors, the social relationship factors, and the material factors, uh, equally in all countries. Well, thank you for that. Um, I think it's about time for us to wrap up. Now, for those of you who have posed questions into the chat, we will do our utmost to answer all of them. Uh, so make sure to check back in. Uh, thank you to the editors and the authors of the World Happiness Report for joining us today, for sharing their thoughts on this year's incredibly thought-provoking report, and for answering all of our questions here and afterwards. Uh, this year also heralds an exciting development, which is the World Happiness Report dashboard, which is now available live at the website worldhappiness.report. This new interactive tool examines happiness over time in every country where the report collects data. Uh, please also remember to register for, for the World Happiness Report 2023 in Asia Pacific Perspective with the editor, Professor Shen Wang, on March 23rd. To learn more about the World Happiness Report, to dive deeper into the research, or to join this team for webinars and in-person events throughout the year, please register at worldhappiness.report. And thank you all for observing the International Day of Happiness with the World Happiness Report team and myself, Sarah P. Jones, on behalf of the world's happiness report team and supporters. I wish you a very happy day wherever it may take you and goodbye. <laughs>